Welcome, everyone, to the uh, latest uh, International Antiviral Society USA uh, webinar. We're really excited, uh, and I think we have a, a large uh, audience to uh, to acknowledge that that we have a, a, a real superstar with us today, Barney Graham, um, who will um, maybe take us kind of beyond the COVID pandemic. Uh, if if there's any benefit to what we've all been through. It's that we might have learned some lessons that we can apply to uh, to other conditions, and so Barney, who has been a, a pioneer in vaccine development, will uh, tackle the topic of how what we've learned, uh, thanks to him uh, and his colleagues in COVID nineteen vaccine development, uh, will influence the future uh, HIV vaccine efforts. Go ahead, the next slide. So um, as a lot of you know, uh, I think you've uh, in many cases attended uh, IASUSA webinars before. Uh, we disclose our uh, relationships. We try to maintain a, a very high firewall between uh, the, the uh, funders of the, of the opportunities that we have for you. Uh, Dr. Graham uh, has the following disclosures that you see on your screen. Um, I'm on a safety data safety monitoring board for uh, Merck, um, and uh, you see that. And next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a CME, Continuing Medical Educational Activity. And as always, uh, we designate uh, this uh, for those that are really participating in it. Uh, and this means uh, today we have 1.25 uh, AMA uh, credits. And again, you should claim only uh, that time for which you actually participated. Next slide. Uh, and again, uh, we are uh, fully aware that the uh, HIV epidemic is, is uh, demands the care of a, of a large team of, of individuals. And that's reflected by the variety of CME activities that we, uh, that we provide. Next slide. The organization uh, receives uh, funding uh, support from uh, a variety of organizations. You see those acknowledged here. Again, we uh, really try to maintain uh, a high barrier between uh, their activities and our education. Next slide. And uh, again, I think at this point, all of us are getting quite familiar with, uh, with the ways of Zoom and uh, and with this uh, webinar, but here's how um, we uh, want you to navigate this. Uh, we'll have questions. Uh, uh, Dr. Graham will have some questions, uh, and uh, you, you'll be asking questions later in the program too for, for Dr. Graham's questions. Uh, they'll show up as a, as a poll, uh, and you can submit uh, your, your response to those. Uh, we'll show those um, responses after the poll closes, that will then prompt um, some further discussion. Uh, you can submit your questions using the Q&A button during the, during the program. Uh, we will try at the end of the program to get to as many of those questions as possible. Uh, we apologize if we, if we can't get to yours because we just often get more than we can, than we can possibly address. Um, and we'll have the chat open and you can um, either send chats to everyone, all of the 500 plus people that have registered for this meeting, uh, or to, uh, to specific uh, attendees. Next slide. And with that, um, I'll, I'll, I'll get us started. Again, the title is How COVID-19 Vaccine Development Will Influence Future uh, HIV Vaccine Efforts. There's absolutely no better person to do that than Barney Graham. Barney uh, has had a number of really important um, uh, positions across his long career. Um, he uh, has been uh, recently at the NIAID and, and also has been active in the Vaccine Center uh, at the NIH. Uh, and he will take us through this, um, uh, this program. Welcome, Barney. Thank you, Paul. and. Uh... Thank you for the opportunity to present. I'm, uh, I'm gonna try to take you through some of my thinking on um, how vaccines work before I get into how we've come through COVID and, and how that might be applied to HIV. And I'm glad to get to give this talk because um, 
we still don't have an HIV vaccine, as all of you know, and it's one of the things that we all committed to uh, at the Vaccine Research Center when we joined back in, in 2000. So um, over this talk, you'll hear some about recent developments um, in where we're at with HIV vaccine development, some of the barriers, and, and then some of the ways in which other vaccine development efforts may inform HIV vaccine development eventually. And so I'm gonna leave this question up for just a minute. It's about class one fusion proteins. And the next question is about what aspects of HIV development have informed coronavirus vaccine development? And now I'm gonna go forward and uh, start with how uh, vaccine development and vaccine advances have often been opportunistic, taking advantage of other technologies that, uh, that were developed in other fields in order to occur. And for the first two vaccines from Jenner and Pasteur, they happened before we knew what immunology or vi virology even was. And, these vaccines were produced in animals, in, in live animals. So either on the hide of a calf or a donkey or in the spinal cord of a rabbit or a dog. And, and uh, they were really just done by the will of uh, certain individuals. The next two vaccines were created largely because Good Pasture learned how to grow pox viruses and, and other viruses in eggs. And, and then the next cluster uh, where vaccines were grown in cells was because Enders and colleagues developed uh, the technology for cell culture and allowing high titer viruses to be produced. And then as we moved into the era of molecular biology, the, it, we don't just grow them in, in cells in bottles, but in large bioreactors and are now able to make things like virus-like particles, recombinant proteins, and molecular clone viruses or reassortant viruses that have all been turned in to vaccines. And in this next era, I count this new vaccine in VSV, a gene-based delivered vaccine uh, for Ebola is part of the new era, but it's also part of the molecular biology era. And in this new era, I think it's gonna be characterized largely by structure-based vaccine design we thought that RSV might be the first example of that, but uh, in the meantime, uh, SARS-CoV-2 slipped in and is now an example of not only structural biology and gene-based delivery, but all these other technologies that have developed or advanced in, uh, substantially over the last uh, 10 to 12 years. I really sort of measure it from about 2008 when things really started changing. And so, uh, and now we're in an era where it's gonna be possible to do chemical synthesis of vaccine and biologics and, and maybe not always have to rely on bioreactors, which, which means that we have opportunities now to move this kind of technology into places that otherwise uh, weren't able to, to do the bioreactor. So as we think about how this applies to HIV, I always like to remember what Dr. Sabin said about HIV vaccines back uh, uh, 30 years ago. And, and he thought it would be in, unlikely that we could ever uh, develop a vaccine because it could uh, transmit intracellularly and, and because of the a rectal portal of entry. I've thought that it would be difficult for other reasons, and, and I'm illustrating one here, um, that in viruses in which, uh, like herpes viruses, for instance, where 
the virus replication and the disease severity are often um, correlate in, in real time. Uh, these kind of persistent virus infections, we don't have examples of effective preventive vaccines. We have vaccines, for instance, for varicella that can boost and prevent recurrence, but we don't have vaccines that can prevent infection. Uh, on the other hand, for viruses that are more acute in nature, like respiratory viruses, like coronaviruses, where uh, the virus replication is often going down by the time symptoms occur. Uh, some viruses like dengue might have a, a little peak of uh, illness with coincident with virus replication, but then another wave during uh, the immune response or immune clearance that causes immunopathology and illness after the fact. These kinds of uh, infections often uh, are susceptible to vaccine development. And uh, to remember uh, some of the basic principles, you know, an antibody only works against the isolated virion. Uh, some antibody functions may be effective against virus infected cells, but by and large, antibody is most effective against isolated virion. So once cells are infected, you really need uh, T cell responses. Um, we think CD8 T cells are the main cytolytic effector, but uh, you need T cells once viruses get infected. And, it, and if they get to the point of latency or sequestration in lymph nodes or infection of immunoprivileged sites like the brain, eye, or testes, then it may be uh, impossible for the immune system to ever fully clear uh, that infection. So we need to keep these in mind as we're trying to develop an HIV vaccine. And and I think what we can hope for, what we hope for in things like coronavirus is not prevention of an infection, but in to rapidly reduce uh, inoculum size and rapidly clear virus before the viral load gets too high. And that's what drives the uh, illness later. And in infections like HIV, we wanna uh, rapidly clear virus infected cells. So we either get an abortive infection or a long-term maintenance of a low viral load. The way we do that, I think, is mostly a matter of timing. And we know as HIV infects, it goes through this uh, bottleneck uh, and then uh, regional replication, but then there's systemic dissemination within uh, a week or 10 days to lymph nodes. And at that point, it's very difficult, if not impossible, for our natural adaptive immune response with antibodies and T cells to clear infection before latency uh, occurs. But if you could have uh, a lot of high potency, broadly effective antibodies at the beginning and reduce inoculum size, limit the amount of uh, regional uh, uh, infection, and then have T cells that rapidly come in and clear virus infected cells before dis systemic dissemination can occur, you may be able to achieve either abortive infection or very low viral loads. And to this point, uh, that has not been uh, possible. And so the, the outcomes of HIV infection could be these uh, favorable outcomes uh, or no effect, or we also have to keep in mind the possibility of disease enhancement. So. Now the question is, uh, what can we learn from other virus infections and other virus vaccine developments that can go back and help uh, us get to an effective HIV vaccine? And I'll start with respiratory syncytial virus because that's where the story starts for me. And it's a virus where I, that I started my career with back in Peter Wright's lab at Vanderbilt with David Carzon's help. And it's a virus that uh, is, uh, uh, leading cause of hospitalization in children under five and infects ciliated epithelial cells in the small airways and type one pneumocytes in, in the alveolar space. And it causes disease largely by creating uh, obstruction in the small airways of young children with mucus and fiber and epithelial debris and inflammatory debris. And so 
uh, preventing that inflammation or at least delaying it until the child is larger and the airway is larger is one of the main goals of RSV vac vaccine development. And on RSV, there's three major surface glycoproteins, and I'll talk mostly about the F glycoprotein here. And we've known about F for a very long time, and we've even known that uh, that there was uh, two forms of F on, on the surface, uh, both a short and a long form. And since uh, solving the, the RSV structure, we know, now know that these short and long forms represent, are represented by the pre-fusion and post-fusion form of the f like protein. And this pre-fusion form was uh, discovered or captured uh, back in the early 2010 period in a collaboration with my lab and Peter Kwong's lab at the VRC with Jason McClellan, uh, the postdoc in Peter's lab, uh, doing a lot of the heavy lifting. And during that uh, process, we found a site on the apex for a new antibody that could hold the top together while we held the bottom together with trimerization domains and found this new structure for the prefusion uh, F, which is now classified as a pneumovirus. And you see that uh, compared to the post F structure after rearrangement that a lot of the surface is uh, conserved. You see this bottom part is relatively un, uh, unchanged, but the top part completely unravels and then rearranges to, to create membrane fusion, ending up in this shape where a lot of this apex is lost. And since finding this structure, it's made it possible to map new antigenic sites on the virus uh, that were previously unknown when in the era of post F, which is what all we had, uh, there were some neutralizing sites in that area that uh, was conserved at the, at the base, but they're relatively low potency. And, and now we know that there is an apical epitope, we call site zero and site five just below it, that are the target of very high potency monoclonal antibodies. Finding this also explained a phenomenon that uh, we didn't previously understand, and, and uh, that is the nature of the RSV uh, whole inactivated, hormone inactivated virus vaccine that caused enhanced disease in the 1960s. And, and so that virus was prepared by incubation at 36 degrees for 72 hours and a low concentration of formalin. When you incubate virus uh, at that temperature, it, most of it is dead by uh, 48 hours. But this is not because uh, of degradation of the genome or the lipid or the integrity of the virus. We think it's now because of flipping of that F protein from the pre to the post-fusion form uh, over time. And uh, we know that because this antibody, motivizumab, which binds one of the epitopes on both pre and post is maintained through this period. But all these antibodies that are known to bind pre-fusion exclusive sites uh, degrade at, at the same rate as the virus is dying. And so this uh, indicates that this vaccine that caused the enhanced illness was all in the post-fusion state. One of the reasons we think this is important is demonstrated here with uh, a vaccine that was developed for, uh, from the F glycoprotein. And this new protein uh, boosts neutralizing activity by uh, about more than tenfold. And if you compete out with the post fusion F, you still are inducing high levels of neutralizing activity, but with the the prefusion F in its native form, uh, you can absorb out any of the neutralizing activity that's that's boosted. And using the F as a probe and looking at the B cell response, you can show that uh, pre-F preferring responses are selectively boosted by this uh, vaccine product based on the prefusion F. And uh, it also boosts some of these dual binding uh, antibodies that can be uh, useful. And the 
vaccines that have been tested over these last several decades that were all based on the post fusion F, we can now demonstrate using, uh, in a collaboration with MetaMune, who used a post fusion F molecule as a vaccine, show that when they boosted uh, their responses, it was almost all dual binding antibodies that were induced, whereas the prefusion F could boost these uh, prefusion exclusive. And, and in the collaboration with Laura Walker at Atomab, where we isolated hundreds of monoclonal antibodies from both adults and children, you can show that the pre-F specific antibodies on average are more than tenfold, sometimes a hundredfold more potent than antibodies that are dual binding and uh, much more potent than any of the post-fusion antibodies. And so starting with this form and discovering this apical epitope during the process of capturing this uh, pre-fusion response explained uh, why the post-F uh, wasn't very effective. The, that epitope disappears. And as I mentioned, historically, these other five vaccine trials that use this molecule could only boost neutralizing activity by twofold. Whereas if you stabilize this molecule with the trimerization domain at the C-terminus and internal disulfide and cavity filling mutations, you know, now have a, a vaccine antigen that can boost uh, upwards of 10 to 20 fold. And so you understand uh, the nature of these class one fusion proteins. I'm just showing you a cartoon at the bottom uh, showing how it starts in this one form, unravels at the top, grabs the host cell membrane, and then these heptad repeats pull the membranes together so the nucleocapsid of the virus can enter the host cell. Without this event, you uh, cannot get a virus infection. And so there's two things that an, you want an antibody to do. You want it to block attachment, but you also want it to interfere with this rearrangement process. And so class one fusion proteins are common on many of the envelope viruses that we're all familiar with and we have vaccine programs for. Pneumoviruses are very similar to paramyxoviruses in their organization. They have this intervening piece they have. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, RSV used to be classified as a, uh, as a paramyxovirus. But class one fusion proteins are also in part of influenza, HIV, Ebola, and Lassa. And in these cases, there is a capping uh, domain that protects the fusion machinery and has to come off in order for that to work. And then coronaviruses have all three of these elements with the intervening piece and the capping mechanism. And so they have functional homology and shared motifs and domains, but very different shapes and topography. And since antibodies recognize surface contours and details of the surface, uh, even though we can learn across these proteins, we really have to get the structures right. So after the um, learning about RSV and uh, during that period of 2012 and 13, during the MERS outbreak, uh, Jason McClellan moved to Dartmouth and uh, we decided uh, to see if we could extend our understanding of these proteins as vaccine antigens to coronaviruses. And after some failed attempts with uh, MERS and the original SARS, we turned to an endemic coronavirus, HKU1. And in collaboration with Andrew Ward, we were able to solve this prefusion spike structure, the first uh, one for human coronaviruses. And then over the next couple of years, we're able to take the fusion machinery and do some of the uh, things we had learned from RSV and found that proline substitutions in between these helical domains at the top of this central helix, so two prolines in this position, could largely stabilize uh, the molecule. And in this case, it not only preserved these uh, apical uh, epitopes as it did for RSVF, but importantly for gene-based vaccine delivery, it also increased expression level. So in transduced cells, uh, these proline mutations, uh, and this showing here for MERS and SARS, because it also, the same mutation worked in these other coronaviruses, it made a protein expression increase by uh, over 50 fold going from this wild type to the uh, 
a proline substituted stabilized spike. So there's two reasons why this may be better for vaccines, especially gene-based vaccines for increased expression and then for other vaccines for, for preservation of apical epitopes. So when SARS-2 uh, showed up at the end of um, 2019, it, it was a, a virus that infected uh, the airways as, as RSV did. Here you see it's infecting ciliated uh, epithelial cells, some of it trapped in mucus. And if you zero in, you can see these uh, virus particles and they're about 80 nanometers in diameter, a little smaller than the diameter of cilia. And you see that the major feature of the virus surface is uh, this um, knob, which is the spike protein. So it's no surprise that the uh, most of the vaccine development programs around the world have focused on the spike as the major target for uh, vaccine development. And the WHO landscape analysis show, uh, has cataloged these and shown that there's now over 300 vaccine development programs uh, in the world, and over 100 of them have now uh, reached uh, clinical evaluation. And many of them, as you know, have gone through efficacy testing and are now uh, either authorized or approved for use in, in large populations. And, and so virtually every uh, different type of modality of vaccine delivery has been tried in, during this last two years. And, and it's another testament to the new technologies that are not only uh, new technologies, but they're, uh, technologies that can be used by many, many groups and uh, all around the world. So for us, um, because of this work that we had done on MERS and other coronaviruses and, and knowing that this two proline mutation could stabilize at least a dozen coronavirus spikes uh, prior to this outbreak, and that was informed by our prior work on RSV, and it was motivated by some of our late attempts in Ebola and Zika to get to the field in time to get an answer before the outbreak waned. Uh, we, uh, because of uh, our uh, interest in pandemic preparedness as well, had started a collaboration with uh, Moderna in, 19, in 2017 to do uh, what we call a prototype pathogen approach for pandemic preparedness. And, and in that, uh, we were using Nipah as a prototype for paramyxoviruses and MERS as a prototype for uh, coronaviruses. And, and, and by the end of 2019, had designed antigens uh, for both families, showed that they worked against lethal challenge in animal models. And, and it, at that time, were prepared to take the NEPA program into a phase one clinical trial. But when this uh, new virus outbreak was reported and we found out around 6th or 7th of January that it was probably a beta coronavirus, uh, we decided to switch the demonstration project uh, on pandemic preparedness to coronavirus. This was before there was any cases in the United States, which didn't show up until around the 20th of January. So when the sequences came out on the 10th, uh, we made uh, our design predictions uh, based on our prior work on other coronaviruses. Uh, we designed things that could be uh, used to make protein. So Jason's group at U now at UT Austin could solve the structure of uh, the spike. Uh, we developed uh, assays for measuring antibody and started immunizing mice and started the vaccine development program with Moderna, who started manufacturing without any additional experimentation, allowing us to get a, a phase one clinical trial started in about 65 days in a phase three in a, a little over six months. Now, the great thing about these new technologies is that many of the elements needed for the vaccine program are also the same things needed to, for new antibody discovery. So as we had been doing with Abcellera, uh, looking for cross-reactive coronaviruses, uh, we sent them a convalescent PBMC sample and a new uh, probe for the new coronavirus spike and 
they went through their rapid sorting and sequencing steps. And we then had antibodies that we screened for neutralizing activity and found some very potent neutralizing antibodies within a few weeks. Lily then took those and uh, began the manufacturing de uh, development process. And within about five months had a phase three trial on this antibody that we call Lily 555 and turned it into bamlanivimab. And they now have other antibodies that, uh, this one is no longer effective for Omicron, but uh, they have other antibodies that are. So the, the point is, is that these new technologies not only help you create uh, vaccines, but also other biologicals uh, for other purposes. And uh, even though this development process was fast, uh, it's not really a one-year story. It could be described as this three-year story of pandemic preparedness and response that we had worked on with Moderna. It could be the eight-year story of solving uh, class one fusion protein structures and understanding how to use them for antigens. Or it could be uh, a larger story going uh, all the way back 15 years or 20 years. But to me, it's really a story of uh, the last 40 years of work in uh, infectious diseases, especially uh, viral diseases and, and viral immunology. And a lot, uh, a lot of that has been driven by trying to make an HIV vaccine. So I attribute most of what's happened in these last two years to uh, work that has been done on HIV trying to make a, a vaccine over these last 40 years. So for us, everything begins with protein structure and uh, we were able to rapidly solve this structure of the new virus and that allowed us to be confident that it was in the right confirmation to make diagnostics or to discover antibodies or to make vaccines as we did with Moderna and this spike structure information uh, and uh, ways of stabilizing Spike were also uh, instrumental in, uh, for these other companies to uh, develop their products either for other mRNA vaccines or adenovirus vector uh, vaccines as Janssen did or some of these subunit vaccines. And uh, so after uh, it was authorized or found to be effective at the end of uh, some very large sets of uh, efficacy trials done by uh, network consortia that came together in a, a massive uh, effort to do more than 200,000 subjects enrollment in three or four uh, big efficacy trials over about six months, uh, the vaccines were authorized for use in the US and then uh, rapidly were uh, distributed around the world. And in Israel, where the rollout was probably more deliberate and organized than any place else, they've done real world, world effectiveness uh, calculations and shown or estimated that even though the vaccines came out uh, a year into the pandemic, uh, they estimate that they may have averted about one third of the, the, vac, uh, the infections that could have happened, but probably about two thirds of the deaths that could have happened. So that is their data from Israel where it was done in the most uh, efficient way. And in the US uh, now represented as deaths per 100,000, looking at uh, the initial ancestral strain wave, the the Delta wave and now the Omicron wave of infections and deaths, uh, this estimate is that these many deaths were averted, which in the US was maybe a little over a million deaths were averted by having these vaccines. Uh, so it's not two thirds of the total deaths like it was in Israel. And part of that is due to uh, what I consider to be a, a not a, an ineffective rollout because of a lot of vaccine hesitancy and, and delayed uh, vaccination. So how do we learn from one virus to the next or one viral family to the next? And I think you are, can see that this work on structure-based vaccine design that really started with HIV, went through RSV and then was used for the coronavirus work 
uh, monoclonal antibody therapeutics and preventive uh, products that were really pioneered also for RSV uh, in the palivizumab product. And then learning about the vaccine enhanced disease that uh, from RSV all contributed to coronavirus vaccine development. And now uh, coronavirus vaccine development has created a proof of concept for the importance of platform manufacturing technologies, rapid manufacturing for uh, new approaches to pandemic preparedness and response, and importantly, for a new vaccine modality that wasn't uh, previously available for commercial use, which is mRNA. And I think it's evidence that these new technologies that I list here again uh, have turned vaccine development from more of an empirical approach to more of an engineering approach and allow us now to maybe be more modular and to be you know, put things on timelines and, and uh, do this in a more uh, systematic way. Some of these technologies uh, improve the precision of antigen design as, as I've showed you with structure-based vaccine design but they can also help improve the targeting, of, for instance, with uh, definition of antibody lineages like has been done in HIV and is now being applied to influenza vaccine development. It wasn't really needed for uh, a development here, but it is being uh, applied to other uh, programs. Or uh, the engineering of these self-assembly nanoparticles, which can display uniform uh, arrays of antigens and increased potency of, of vaccine antigens. The other technologies are uh, increase our speed or simplicity of manufacturing, creating a possibility for, for going fast or for expanding these technologies to other areas. And mRNA is probably the best example of, a, of the breakthrough uh, technology in coronaviruses and there's uh, at least three ways that mRNA can be used as a vaccine. One is with unmodified nucleotides and, and making them stable through formulation practices. The other is self-amplifying RNA, which uses the alpha virus amplicon to make lots of copies and transcripts to create a lot of rapid protein production. And the other is what was used by Pfizer or BioNTech and Moderna, which is modified nucleotide, uh, the pseudouridine, uh, in this case, the one methyluridine that was used in the uh, production of the mRNA. And that, that technology was pioneered by Caitlin Carrico and Drew Weissman at University of Pennsylvania. And it helps avoid some of the signaling that occurs in either uh, uh, TLR7 or TLR3 uh, processes or intracytoplasmic detection of uh, RNA that would lead to interferon uh, induced expression and, and inflammation and reduce the time that protein could be expressed from that transduced cell. And some of the advantages of RNA are that it, it is rapid, uh, but Importantly, it's by chemical synthesis now instead of uh, just with the large bioreactors. It can induce both antibody and CD8 T cells, not just uh, antibody, and it also promotes uh, both a Th1 differentiated CD4 and T follicular helper cells, which have improved uh, overall antibody responses. We now have data from hundreds of millions of people that it's safe and effective. There's not anti-vector immunity as there would be in some other gene-based delivery approaches. And the stability and supply chain is improving and eventually it will likely be lyophilizable and something that could be stored even at room temperature. For me, one of the important features is that it's a small footprint, a small batch manufacturing approach that is well suited for low and middle income countries. It, and not only could it uh, allow distributive manufacturing and better surge capacity when we have problems like this, but would also allow local investigators to have a, a mechanism for rapid iterative design cycles. So if uh, uh, 
people in Nigeria want to make the Lhasa virus vaccine or people in Kenya want to make a Rift Valley fever vaccine, people in Mexico want to make a Myora virus vaccine, that this is a platform that would be amenable to that kind of local uh, uh, development when they may not be commercially viable uh, programs. There's also a lot of room for improvement in the RNA technology. This is the very beginning of this. And, and so I've listed some ways in which this could be improved. And, and lastly, I just want to remind people that this is not magic. It's a, it's a gene-based delivery approach. And if you don't deliver the right design antigen, uh, it, it probably won't work. Getting back to HIV, will mRNA solve uh, our HIV vaccine development programs. And uh, in my opinion, uh, there's still a lot of basic uh, biology and immunology that has to be solved before we can get back to successful HIV vaccine development. And I'm listing some of them here. Some of the immunology things that have to be solved are how to uh, deal with antigenic variation, both in terms of initial design for prevention, but also to prevent against uh, escape uh, during the chronic infection. How to deal with immunodominance, which is all, also a problem in influenza and hepatitis C, and how to target the right antibody lineages. Uh, this is still not something we uh, can uh, really reliably do. We also have to improve um, how to maintain selected B and T cell memory phenotypes so that we don't have a waning immunity and maybe have to learn how to better induce these responses in the right place. Um, as Dr. Saban warned, uh, maybe in the rectum and other uh, mucosal sites. We have to learn more about uh, how to overcome or delay the virus ability to persist in a evade uh, our immunity. And, and so these are things that I think we still need to solve and may take breakthroughs in order to get to the point of using even our new technologies for um, successful HIV vaccine development. I'm also hoping that the work that's been done now on RSV and is being done on influenza and, and coronavirus can all be folded back to uh, HIV and inform HIV, which has all of these ways of evading, neutralizing antibody responses. And between the genetic diversity and glycosylation, conformational evasion and immunodominance problems, these viruses together uh, may help uh, inform future HIV vaccine development efforts. And uh, not just for antibody, and I just put this slide here stopping in 2013, showing this history of vaccine development concepts were mostly focused on antibody initially. And then in this middle period, we're focused almost entirely on CD8 T cell responses. And now with uh, some of those failures are now focused again, almost exclusively on antibody mediated responses. And I, I really think as I started that for vaccine, uh, effective HIV vaccine development, we're going to have to have both antibody uh, for prevention and reduction of inoculum size and rapid effective cytolytic T cells to rapidly clear virus infected cells for control of uh, viral load. So um, those are some of my thoughts on how coronavirus might apply back to HIV. I want to conclude by just reminding you that these new technologies have transformed vaccinology and, and I think are providing solutions for longstanding problems and new ways of dealing with emerging viral diseases, especially combining uh, this precision antigen design uh, with rapid manufacturing is going to create solutions for not just uh, a pandemic response, but also for other uh, vaccine problems. And that for HIV vaccines, I think new breakthroughs are still going to be needed. So I want to uh, thank some people here. This is the lab that I left. I retired from the Vaccine Research Center a few months ago and uh, it was a great privilege for me to work with this group of people and, 
and also the principal investigators and program heads at the VRC over these last 20 years, a uh, real privilege, not just for the facilities and the equipment, but for these uh, remarkable people I had a chance to work with. And for our collaborators, especially Jason McClellan, who's uh, now a professor at UT Austin, uh, the group at Shaman Medical University who helped find some of those initial antibodies for RSV, uh, Neil King, who's been important for our influenza program uh, with his technology for making uh, uh, self-assembly nanoparticles, and the group of academic and industry collaborators that made the coronavirus vaccine development possible. And for other parts of NIAID, especially BMID, who helped with the clinical evaluation and rapid movement into the phase three trials. So I'll stop there and take any questions you might have. Uh, oh, and go back to the questions, which I hope uh, you have uh, gotten during this last few minutes. Okay, and now to Correct. the next one. Okay. Okay. Barney, uh, thank you very much. Uh, really a, a tour de force of obviously hugely important topic. Um, I think reflected by the large audience that we have um, over 350 uh, people listening in and looking over the names, um, some of the real leaders in, in HIV and in, in COVID response. Um, so just reminding everyone to ask questions in the in the Q&A, we're starting to uh, collect some of those. Um, and, and maybe I could start with a kind of a speculation that I uh, have wondered. Um, you showed us how complex uh, HIV has evolved to basically um, uh, prevent effective vaccination. Um, can you speculate on environmentally or, or, or uh, historically why a virus would have done that? Why, why did HIV almost uniquely, it seems, uh, decide to evolve, evolve uh, such, a, such a protection against immunity? Well, uh, <laughs> I know it's left field, but <laughs> it's mine. I take credit. <laughs> I, I, uh, I agree with you that this is a mystery, and it's one of the things we maybe we need to understand better. I, I, I wish Beatrice Hahn was on the line so she could right, help me right. with Betty Korber answer some of these things. But, you know, viruses survive by selection. And uh, HIV being this lentivirus that can infect a person for so long before you even see symptoms and be it be there adapting not only to uh, your innate, but your adaptive immunity over years and years, uh, selecting new variants that can survive and evolve and then eventually transmit to others. And it's, uh, it's not just these single rapid infections like a respiratory virus would do, but it's this long-term maintenance of replication in humans over many, many years. So the number of replication cycles in, uh, that have occurred in humans over these last you know, 100 years, probably since HIV started, um, you know, has allowed it to evolve in some very unique ways. Oh, great. So uh, I should kind of allow some of the audience to ask questions as well. Uh, so a question about um, uh, from Susan Zola Posner, uh, we succeeded in stabilizing apical epitopes on HIV on trimers, uh, but the critical epitopes for BNABs are poorly immunogenic. How do you uh, suggest we might overcome that problem? Right. Uh, well, that whole process of stabilizing those apical epitopes is what allowed us to get into the RSV uh, F uh, program. And, uh, and for, fortunately for RSV, that was all we had to do. For HIV, uh, 
you know, this glycan shield, even though coronaviruses have 22 to 25 glycans per protomer, so they're heavily glycosylated. They're not nearly as heavily glycosylated as HIV. And this idea that you uh, not only have to have an antibody that uh, has the right angle of approach and just the right biophysical properties in its CDR3 to reach into between the glycans and in the crevice of the proteins to hit just the right spot in a virus that's constantly mutating, you know, that, is a, uh, that is a big load for, for a vaccine uh, for immunity induction. So we do have really good antigens now uh, over these last few years. People have been able to do the stabilization. The question is now, is there a way for us to learn how to really um, induce uh, B cell responses that make antibodies that have all these other geometric and biophysical properties that will hit it just in the right way. And, that is still something that's, that's very difficult. And what I've told uh, a lot of other people is that in my opinion, uh, even though HIV vaccine development, like uh, Sabin said, might be impossible, working on HIV vaccine development uh, is something we have to do, but it's also the thing that will drive the the solutions for every other vac virus out there. And in my, if we can solve HIV vaccine development, I think we'll be prepared for all other emerging viral infectious diseases. Uh, great. Uh, question uh, from your old stomping grounds at Dades. Uh, what role do you see for non-neutralizing, uh, that is functional antibodies other than neutralization uh, in the near future? Well, we're learning a lot more about those and uh, the, the programs that look at FC mediated uh, effector functions of antibodies that could potentially help in, in virus infected cell clearance. And um, I think we're getting a better handle on those. I, I think the problem is it's, it's still a little hard to know how to uh, specifically induce just the right thing with the vaccine. And in some cases, those uh, effector mechanisms uh, can cause harm. One of the immunological basis for the vaccine enhanced disease of RSV is that all those non-neutralizing antibodies that were elicited uh, by the post-fusion F uh, ended up causing immune complex deposition in small airways. So uh, you want um, you want a way to diminish the overall viral load, I think. And so those antibodies can be very helpful, but can also in some ways be harmful. Or in, so I, I just think we have a lot more to learn about how to induce just the right ones. Uh, great. Uh, another interesting question. I, I noticed during, during your presentation that you talked about the uh, uh, interaction with innate uh, immunity and, uh, and the mRNA. Question about HIV vaccines, uh, is which they speculating that these tend to be more difficult for neutralizing uh, antibody induction. Should the mRNA vaccine not be modified, uh, as with SARS, uh, so that the uh, TLRI, TLR TLR78, TLR3 uh, is maintained for better adjuvant effect. Well, that's part of the strategy for using these self-amplifying RNAs where you uh, put in an RNA that has that uh, amplicon from alpha viruses. And so you make lots and lots of transcripts and that really creates a lot of innate immune stimulation at the same time as a lot of protein production but it all happens very rapidly. So I think that is the strategy that you may be alluding to, that, that you will get a lot of TLR7, TLR3, internal interferon induction going on with a lot of protein that would then kind of self-adjuvant. But in the case of modified nucleotides, it's more stealth. You get a longer period of uh, protein expression and some other qualities, I think, including TFH, uh, uh, somewhat selectively uh, induced that 
that are also good. And I, I think that's part of what we still have to learn about RNA is, you know, where is the right balance and, and should we uh, dial that up or down for other diseases? A question from a region of high HIV impact in Uganda. Uh, do we have any examples? Uh, do we have any example of a vaccine that both cures a disease and prevents reinfection? The, the questioner is asking about therapeutic vaccination. What's the possibility of this approach for HIV? Right. Uh, well, therapeutic vaccines we've have been tried several times over the years with different modalities, either protein subunits or gene-based approaches, mostly using DNA or ad vectors. But so far, um, once HIV is established and has so much uh, diversity within uh, that person, it's been very hard to induce uh, any new responses. Generally, what happens is you're boosting pre-existing responses that have already been escaped. And so um, I don't know if it's possible. I think that um, some therapeutic vaccine efforts are being uh, tested now for malignancies, for neoplasms, where you make uh, vaccine antigens against the, the uh, modified parts or the polymorphisms in the cancer. And, and so maybe we'll learn something about that that can be applied to HIV or tuberculosis or other things in which uh, we really would like to have therapeutic vaccines. Thanks so much. Um, uh, and I'll just parenthetically say that Dr. Graham, uh, one of the many contributions he made to HIV was chairing a process where the NIAID looked at their Centers for AIDS research and years and years ago and decided that in fact it was worth saving. And I think that that program, and I'm, I'm, I'm no longer uh, part of it, uh, but that program was a great basis for a lot of responses to the COVID-19 epidemic as well. So I think uh, we'll, th we'll thank him for that. Uh, really an interesting uh, a point here from someone uh, in USAID uh, talking uh, about you uh, and your, your amazing career. Uh, and I'll just read it because it's a good question. Uh, Varney, your persevering hard work, love of math, deep wisdom and patience have saved millions of lives. Thank you. Uh, what advice do you have to encourage young scientists who struggle to see their own work succeed given the highly competitive environment in which they work? Uh, really um, uh, important question. Well, um, one of the, I, I, Thank you for that comment, but um, I think one of the things that uh, young people have to find are mentors who will not only uh, support them and mentor them, but sponsor them and open doors for them and, and make things uh, feasible for them. And so this is something that I, I hope can uh, that we can get better at because we really do need more uh, biologists and more scientists. And one of my great hopes from this pandemic is that all the seven, eight, nine, 13, 14 year old children out there who had to live through this and have had their lives so disrupted will all want to be viral immunologists. And maybe they'll be the generation who finally helps us solve HIV. But, you know, uh, I really like Caitlin Carrico's answer to this question. So I'm gonna tell you what she would say. And uh, because she's, uh, you can read about her, but she's gone through a lot of uh, hard times and, and what other people would call failures, but she talks about just the joy in the process of science. And, and if you really uh, love the, the process, whether the experiment works or not, you know, if you can use that experience to learn something and and advance and and look for the long term, um, you know, the delayed gratification in that moment. Uh, that I think that's the way you have to be a scientist. You you, you can't really expect uh, for rapid results in, in science. It's just and uh, and what I used to tell my students is if you don't get a thrill out of sealing the FedEx envelope, which we obviously don't have to do anymore. Uh, 
But if you don't get a thrill out of sealing the envelope and sending the paper or the grant off, then you're just not going to make it because uh, that's the part that you have to be able to enjoy. You can't necessarily uh, get the outcome you want in the end. Sending the grant off one minute before the uh, the pickup deadline and contracts and grants, right? Remember so well. Uh, 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 thanks, uh, Barney. A question here about uh, non-human primate models. Uh, talk a little bit about the challenges of using uh, using those in uh, HIV vaccine development. Uh, why, why has it been such a problem? Um, is, it, is it differences in the cells, immune responses, et cetera? Well, I think we've learned a lot over this time, also actually from HIV, how many uh, internal proteins uh, impact just the process of virus replication. And, uh, you know, Apovec uh, and all these other uh, molecules that can uh, alter the way a virus gets through the interferon response. And, you know, many respiratory viruses, all of which have interferon inhibiting molecules, uh, also have problems in, in real realistic animal models, I think largely because those interferon inhibiting molecules have not adapted to that new species or those new inter intracellular molecules. And so, you know, I have animal models listed as one of the new technologies, and I'm, I'm really hoping that if we could understand uh, viruses in enough depth, that we could then engineer animal models to, to have uh, the properties that would be make them more human-like for any given virus infection, and so we would uh, you could replace the apobec, and you could replace the the different molecules that affect innate immune responses, as well as uh, you know may, uh, receptors and other things that the virus needs to enter cells. So I just think that this uh, all the different adapter molecules used needed for replication. Uh, also need to be matched to get the right innate immune response in the initial part of the animal model. And, you know, I just don't think we quite know enough to do the, all that uh, readily for, for each virus. So here, here might be a quick uh, question, Dr. Graham. Uh, what about uh, mRNA approaches for influenza? Um, is that under, underway? Uh, well, yes, even before this pandemic, Moderna had published articles on an uh, influenza HA molecule uh, for H7 and H10 immunization. Um, there are efforts to use mRNA for influenza. The problem again there as for HIV is uh, delivering by mRNA doesn't really um, give you the ability to overcome the genetic uh, uh, variability and antigenic variability. And, and so in order to overcome both the immunodominance problems where you're having antibodies misdirected or the wrong ones boosted and to, to uh, accommodate the uh, genetic variability uh, where you need cross-reactive, uh, you need to be recognizing cross-reactive epitopes that are often subdominant. Uh, you need a different way of presenting the antigen. And, and I don't think mRNA alone will do that. I think mRNA is useful because it may give us a lot more shots on goal. But if the RNA isn't delivering something that can overcome that antigenic uh, variability, uh, it's just not going to work. So I, I notice um, that there have been uh, questions coming into the uh, to the chat as well as the Q and A function. I'm sorry, I've been really just monitoring. It's hard to monitor <laughs> two streams. Uh, I've just been monitoring the the Q and A uh, line. But Connie Kellum asked a question about adjuvants. So do you want to uh, on the chat line? Do you want to comment on uh, on the status of adjuvants and are we making progress there and what's their role in all this? Well, it's nice to hear from you, Connie, and all the other HIV friends I've heard right. from on this line. So, uh, well, 
One of the big things that happened during this two years uh, that will also help future vaccine development is that a lot of things got to be tested in humans that otherwise would have taken years and years more time to ever get tested. And so uh, there's been uh, evaluation of uh, several different adjuvants. The Matrix M has now been in tens or hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, the uh, CPG alum uh, adjuvant has been now used in tens uh, over millions of people and other adjuvants uh, beyond just the ASO1 that we're familiar with for uh, varicella uh, and, and uh, MF59, all these things, have, there's a lot more adjuvants that have been tested and have now clinical um, safety profiles that will make it more possible to take them forward into new vaccine campaigns. So I don't know that any one adjuvant stands out as being the best. Uh, you know, there's also been the, the TLR78 agonist that has gotten out into the clinic. And so, uh, and I think most adjuvants uh, need to be fit for purpose that not one adjuvant is not gonna be the best thing for every different antigen. So, uh, but the good thing that's happened is that they now have clinical data that I think will help move new adjuvant programs in, into new uh, vaccine programs. Thanks. Uh, 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 several people have asked uh, about uh, the availability of this program in uh, recordings, um, and my ISUSA colleagues will correct me, but I'm pretty sure it is going to be available. Um, and uh, I think I think it does, um, it's the quality of program that would be good to here again for uh, for a lot of people, I think. Um, a question about um, uh, the limitations of self-amplifying uh, mRNA technologies, um, uh, suggesting based on a recent study that um, that it generated only a low percentage of seroconversion. Um, what's wrong in the design of antigen for self-amplifying uh, mRNA vaccine design? Well, I don't know if there's anything wrong with it uh, per se. Uh, one of the reasons we started working with Moderna was that our experience in 2016, when we made a Zika vaccine from DNA and they made a, one of these modified nucleotide R mRNA vaccines for Zika. And we worked with another group that made a self-amplifying uh, RNA vaccine for Zika. And we tested all of those things in our animal models. and in that case, um, the Moderna mRNA vaccine was extremely more potent than our DNA vaccine, which we think was probably good enough to work, but not nearly as potent as the Moderna RNA. And that's what led us to make the agreement with them for a pandemic preparedness pilot project or demonstration project. But the self-amplifying RNA that we tested for Zika was also quite good in the monkey model. I think it's maybe a little more challenging to, to manufacture and um, it still doesn't have uh, all the formulation experience, the lipid nanoparticle formulation experience that the BioNTech and Moderna have had uh, around their modified nucleotides. And so I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with the self-amplifying mRNA concept. And I think it may be, uh, it could be the uh, modality of choice for some, uh, for some products. I, I just think it needs more work. All of these RNAs are sort of in the early stages. You know, I, I still don't think we have um, enough knowledge about how secondary RNA structure affects uh, translation efficiency or how it affects some of the innate immune stimulation events. You know, I think there's still a lot to learn about how uh, downstream processing and purification away from any kind of double-stranded RNA artifacts that are left will affect toxicity. I, I think you see that a lot of the uh, RNAs uh, were, the dosing was based on the limit of toxicity. So there's dose limiting toxicity, and that's what determined the dose more than how effective it was. And so 
there's a lot to learn about how to get the dose right and how to get the design right uh, that I think still needs to be worked on. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Um, so uh, more questions, but there is a, a, an issue. We'd like to have you go back to your post-test questions um, and review those and the answers to the, to the audience so people can see um, how, they, how they did in, in all of this. Do you want to do that, Barney? Can you share your screen again? Oh, OK. And by the way, that uh, this will be posted within 24 hours uh, online. Okay, so this one, uh, class one fusion proteins, I, I mentioned, um, well, I, we had all sorts of answers on that uh, question. So I mentioned um, that pneumoviruses like RSV or paramyxoviruses like parainfluenza or NEPA, they are classical class one fusion proteins with that intervening piece. And so those are both class one fusion proteins. HIV-M or GP160 is a class one fusion protein. It's the kind with the capping mechanism. GP120 is the cap for the GP41 fusion machinery. Herpes viruses have a different type of fusion machinery. They have what's called a class three fusion protein. And some of the at least preliminary structures of the prefusion form of the herpes GB uh, have recently been uh, published. So you can go look and see what a class three fusion protein looks like for herpes, but it is not a class one, it's a class three. And then uh, this one, um, you know, the, the answer is uh, three, structure-based vaccine design. HIV structure-based vaccine design work is what informed the RSV work, which is what informed the coronavirus work. Uh, mRNA has been used in experimental settings for HIV, but it really wasn't a big part of what led to coronavirus mRNA use. And, and the lipid nanoparticles the same even though they have been used in some cases for uh, uh, DNA delivery, it's just not the same technology. And then targeting B cell lineages has been an important uh, uh, type of technology that has been pioneered in HIV by people like John Muscola and Bart Haynes and Dennis Burton uh, and, and et cetera. And hopefully I didn't leave too many people out there, but. This is, this is really amazing technology, looking at antibody uh, genes isolated from individual cells and then looked at, uh, you know, with computational biology. And, and this uh, really helps you select a target for these broadly neutralizing antibodies that might be uh, induced or uh, tried to get into that mode of broad neutralization. At least if you start with those lineages, they have a chance of evolving toward broadly neutralizing antibodies. And it's the basis for uh, Bill Sheaf's um, EOD pr program that tries to target antibody lineages to the C4 binding site. And so, uh, but those haven't really been used for coronavirus. They haven't really been needed yet for coronaviruses. And, but it is a big part of the flu influenza program. So uh, the answer there was supposed to be number three. Okay, great. Um, we're running out of time, but uh, there's a question that I like is it takes, takes me back uh, to the early HIV uh, days. Um, uh, any insight into why various primate uh, species um, may tolerate HIV infection without disease, uh, while others um, have uh, have rapid disease progression? Uh, does does your work shed light on that old question? No, but I think other people's work has shed light on that. Uh, I mean, I I think part of it is the coevolution, and and so. For some, uh, for some like African green monkeys in Africa, uh, they've co-evolved with SIV uh, and now have CD4 
type cells that don't really even express CD4 anymore. So uh, their CD4 cells that function like CD4 cells don't express CD4. And, and maybe that's the reason they don't uh, get as sick with uh, this SIV infection. So I think it may be a matter of uh, coevolution. That's why the SIV put into macaques is more likely to cause a severe disease because they haven't had a chance to co-evolve and adapt the way, um, the way uh, African greens have, for instance, or the way uh, chimpanzees and others uh, in Africa have had a chance to adapt. So a question about um, revaccination. I think we're all thinking a lot about that these days with, uh, with COVID. Uh, speculation about uh, the possibility that uh, repeated rounds of vaccination for HIV may overcome some of the challenges that we've uh, that we've seen. For HIV, I mean, one of the problems uh, for HIV is that um, for any vaccine development program, as you can see, how much hesitancy there already is. Is you have to make it practical enough for people to even be willing to try. And so, um, you know, it's rare for any vaccine uh, to ever be su successful on the market with more than three doses. Uh, it's really better if you can get it down to one dose. And so I think doing experimental studies with repeated doses and repeated vaccines uh, could be informative scientifically, but it then would need to leave to something with, with a product that would be more practical. And one of the problems of the repeated vaccination uh, that you may be alluding to is that, um, you know, in experiments, you want rapid results. And so a lot of the experiments we do will boost every three weeks or every two weeks trying to get to a point that we want to be. And if you boost that often, you often will kill the response uh, by the time you get to the third or fourth dose, uh, just because you're killing some of your activated memory cells. And we saw that early on back in the 90s when we were giving monthly doses of GP120 antigen and saw by the third or fourth dose that antibody titers started going down instead of up. And so for repeated dosing to really work for boosting the right kind of memory phenotype, I think there needs to be at least a 12 to 16 week uh, interval to get the really uh, good boosted response. And, and studying that in animal models, um, it just takes too long. I, I, I think it's gonna be a, a hard slog to have a multi-dose vaccine. And maybe there's a lesson there for those of us that have had our boost, not to race off, <laughs> to sneak Don't another race boost in. in. Wait right, at right. least four months. I would right, say right. wait at least four months. Okay, good. Um, I think we're uh, really at the at the time, uh, Dr. Graham. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, a lot of comments uh, thanking you for your uh, for your work and your your careful explanation of the challenges that that uh, you you summarized. Um, thanks to the IES USA uh, staff for putting this together. Um, again, we'll post this again um, within 24 hours. Um, and here's some uh, more information about um, your, your credits for, uh, uh, for attending uh, and to ways to stay in touch uh, with, uh, with the organization. So I, is there, I don't know if there's another slide, but um, I think I think if, oh, here's a, a, a number of other uh, um, activities that uh, the organization is sponsoring um, and uh, encourage people to participate. Um, and uh, thank you uh, in advance for coming to our uh, uh, discussion this week, uh, where I will uh, act as a, as a moderator with uh, three people who have been very much uh, in the in the public eye uh, with COVID response, Peter Chin Hong, Carlos Del Rio, and Bonnie Maldonado, uh, who will be talking about the latest on uh, on uh, uh, COVID nineteen. Uh, so, um, any more slides? One more, <laughs> okay. Um, management uh, uh, conference in Atlanta on April eighth. 
um, and um, other ways to get information from, uh, from the organization with the topics in antiviral medicine. Um, sooner or later, we're going to run out of new slides. Um, and, and here is uh, the, the other kind of little side thing that the organization does. We manage um, the, the CROI conference. Uh, we're hoping for back to in person, but it's virtual again this year. Um, I, I think we can maybe safely predict, who knows, uh, that we'll be back next year. So uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Graham. It's been, it's been really a, a joy to have you here with us. Um, and I think the, the, the comments have been very appropriate for your leadership. So uh, thanks again, and thanks for all the people that, uh, that, that participated today very much. Thank you, Paul. It's good to see you again. Good to see you.